Radio Mystery Theater presents... as the art of storytelling goes. One of the most treasured examples of the narrative technique has been that of the ghost story. The ancient belief in ghosts was rooted in the idea that the spirit of a man never dies. These spirits may appear in any form, and the most terrifying have been the apparitions that belong to those who died a violent or unnatural death. That streak of lightning... That crack of thunder, is that usual here in the desert? With a full moon staring down on us? Talk, Joe! Like I tell you, this road lead to place where evil spirits dwell. Spirits of the dead. Big danger for white men. You smart men, you turn back. drama, Roll Call of the Dead, was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Russell Horton and Lloyd Baptista. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Thursday on CBS TV, it's the season premiere of Knott's Landing. And what will happen to Gary's sizzling love affair with Abby when he learns of Val's angry decision? You're not staying here. I will stay where I like and I will sleep where I like. And Gary pushes Karen to her limit, too. Gary, you're fired. Don't miss the searing action on the season premiere of Knott's Landing. Thursday at 10, 9 Central and Mountain on CBS TV. Call me a liar and I'm going to walk out that door. I won't go to Val, but I'm not coming back here either. Hello, I'm Nancy Marchand. When we speak of priorities, there's one that comes first with most of us, the well-being of our families. Unfortunately, millions of families in developing countries know only poverty, hunger, and sickness. You can help them through care. Your contributions will provide the means for survival today and self-support tomorrow. Contribute to care. Box 576, New York 10156 or your local care office. Tommy, it's official. What's official? All the results of my survey. What survey? All the results show you are the winner. <laughs> what winner? You've been voted the best-dressed man in town. Mm, uh-huh. By uh, whom? <laughs> By me. It was a uh, survey of one. Well, you're all that counts. And that counts for a lot. Maurice L. Rothschild Clothing for Men can make it easy for you to look your best. Six locations in Chicago and suburbs, expert tailoring service, and prices low enough to fit any budget. That's the way it's been at Rothschild's for 100 years. Maurice L. Rothschild, the kind of fine men's clothing that makes things happen. Let it happen for you today. Okay, here's my acceptance speech. Ready? Uh -huh. <clears throat> Thank you for voting me the best-dressed man in town. But I couldn't have done it alone. Oh, cheated, huh? Oh, yeah, I buy my clothes at Rothschild. Oh, I would have voted for you if you didn't have any clothes. Oh. <laughs> Maurice L. Rothschild at Randers, Harlem Irving, Ford City, Woodfield, Six Corners, and 34th and King Drive. Maurice L. Rothschild. Fine men's clothing. Let it happen. facets of American history have been more over-sentimentalized than the story of the settlement of our great west. We have been given the stereotypes of the noble, tragic Indian, the rough and ready cowboy, and the gun-happy desperado. But if the story of the west is to have any real meaning, we must look to the writing of those who dealt with its dust, its dirt, its hard work, its personal tragedy, and sometimes with the unknown, the unexpected. Two young men about to graduate from an eastern college are in a tent watching an exhibition of western skills and food. She hasn't missed a single shot. Hey, that woman is absolutely phenomenal. Jimmy, look at her now. She's turning herself around, galloping around the ring, sitting backwards on her horse. <laughs> and shooting at the target as her horse goes around at full speed. Bullseye every time. Oh, no, Jimmy, look what she's doing now. Swinging herself under the belly of her horse, holding onto the saddle with one hand. Her assistant is handing her a fresh rifle as she goes by. Yeah, she's pointing the rifle at the target. 
And wham! Right into the bullseye again. Look, Jimmy. There's the great Buffalo Bill himself. Ladies and gentlemen, the Buffalo Bill Wild West Show with its Congress of Rough Riders of the World has presented Miss Annie Oakley in her astonishing demonstration of dexterity in the use of firearms. She certainly was wonderful. And now, for our closing number, we will demonstrate how a cow outfit is brutally attacked on the Great Plains by a band of bloodthirsty marauding Indians who in turn are repulsed by the brave veterans of the splendid 6th U.S. Cavalry. Maestro, if you please. Just look at them go, Jimmy. Huh? Huh? Jimmy, huh? I have a great idea. What is it? After we get our diplomas in June, what do you say you and I go out with? What for? For the fun of it and the excitement. Well, in another 10, 20 years, it'll probably all be gone. This is 1888. Time is passing us, Jimmy. What are you thinking of? Oh, uh, we're young. The West is still young. I don't want to learn about it from Wild West shows. I want to see what's left of it for myself. Hey, I'm all for it, Clark. How about the Arizona Territory? The Santa Fe Railroad will take us as far as New Mexico. And from there on, it's clear sailing all the way to the California border. Jimmy, old friend, here we are. Yeah, where are we? Uh, this, this can't be Santa Fe. Oh, no, this, this is Lamy, territory of New Mexico. Santa Fe's about 15 miles to the north. We can hire one of those buggies over there to take us to town. Uh -huh. And then? We pick up a reliable guide, some pack horses, firearms, whatever we need by way of supply. And uh, maps, Clark, lots of maps. Sooner or later, we're going to get to places that have never been maps. That's the whole idea. <laughs> Clark, that old Indian, he's been eyeing us. I, I think he's coming over to us. Yeah, so he is. I wouldn't want to meet him anywhere alone on a dark night. Welcome, young gentlemen. Welcome to territory of New Mexico, United States of America. Uh, we know. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to help you if you want. Well, that's very kind of you, uh, sir. Uh, I am Joe. Joe Broken Arrow, tribe of Apache. Well, I'm I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Uh, Arrow. Joe, Joe, you call me Joe. You know, Joe, I think you might be able to help us. After we rest up in Santa Fe from this long train trip, we're headed west. Southwest, as a matter of fact, to the Arizona Territory. Yeah, and we'd appreciate some advice if, if you'd be so kind about uh, supplies, horses, uh, things like that. Oh, we, we'd pay for your time, of course. You say you go southwest Arizona? We're planning to follow the course of the Gila River, way past the Catalina Mountains. Oh, bad place, very bad place, especially for a white man. Why... Why do you say that, Joe? Well, one thing for sure, you need good guide. You not go that place yourself. Very dangerous. Why, Joe? We're not afraid, you know. Better you take me with you. I be your guide, you Indian scout. I know that country better than anyone. I, I, I give us a minute, Joe. Uh, Clark, what do you think? I mean, his looks worry me. His face is like a death mask. I mean, can we trust this little bird? I'm not too sure. I must say, with that big black hat pulled down up to his eyes, he does not exactly inspire me with the greatest confidence. Young gentlemen, you not worry about Joe. Joe Broken Arrow, how you say it, very reliable. Jimmy? Well, why not? All right, Joe, you're on. You not be sorry, young gentlemen. Only, only one thing. Yes? If I work for you, whenever time come, make decision about anything. You listen, Joe. Do what Joe say. Sometime, especially where we go, could be, how you say it, matter of life or death. 
You understand, huh? I... I... Sure, Joe, uh, we understand. Sounds like a big, round, orange ball of fire. Yeah, it'll be setting pretty soon. Clark, good thing we decided, or rather Joe back there decided for us, that we do most of our traveling in the darkness, sleeping in the daytime. We'd burn to ashes under that broiling sun. Oh, and Jimmy, look what it does to the rocks on those mountains. Yeah, like they were painted in a hundred different colors. <laughs> Which way, Joe? We come to what looks like a fork in the road. Wait, wait, young gentlemen. I come to you. We, we go north. Take right fork. Whatever you say, Joe. Uh, wait a minute, Jimmy. And Joe, can I ask about this other road, the one to the left? Any reason for not taking that one? Left fork, very dangerous, not safe. How? Why? Lead to place where evil spirits dwell, spirits of the dead, bad, ugly spirits. Well, we're not afraid of things like that, are we, Jimmy? Well, no, not really. Uh, no, Joe, we are not afraid. Uh, you listen, Joe. Take other road. This way, Clark. Well, hold on a bit, Jimmy. We didn't come thousands of miles all the way out here just to look for the safe ways. We came for the adventure, the excitement, remember? Well, I... I, I guess so. <laughs> sure, of course. Then let's not play it safe. We take the chance. See what old Joe is talking about, all right? All right. So we take right fork. Left fork not only lead to place of evil, is also place of big danger to white man pass through Apache territory. So what? Apache, wild, fierce. I know. I know well. Of course, you're an Apache. So we take right fork to north. For once, we're going to disappoint you, Joe. We take left fork, the bad one, to south. <laughs> What's that? He's coyote. Come on, let's go. What time you got, Jimmy? Oh, nearly 4 a.m. We ought to be turning in pretty soon. Yeah, lucky we got a full moon with us tonight. Mm, true. Its light makes these desert sands look like so many fields of snow. Remind you, Clark, of back home? What on earth was that? That flash of lightning out of nowhere. <laughs> Split the sky wide open. Oh, that's crazy. Lightning and thunder in the desert with no clouds and a full moon? How could that be? Joe! Yes? Come here a minute, will you? You, uh, you want something, young gentleman? That streak of lightning just now, the thunder, is that usual here in the desert this time of year? With a full moon shining down on us? You understand what we're asking you, Joe? I understand. Well, then what's the explanation? Is that usual? Should we have expected it? It's not, how you say it, usual. But you must expect such things. Why? Well, like I tell you, this road lead to place of evil. What happened here, not usual. Sometime evil spirit give warning. Everything very strange. Not again. I just don't get it. Clark, uh, look over there to the left. No more than a hundred feet from us. Do, do you see what I see? What is that? It looks like... like a smokestack. A tall masonry smokestack. Rising right out of the sagebrush. Out of that dry gulch. Uh, look behind it. A whole set of furnaces. Brand new furnaces of some kind. Well, those are... Or smelters, I think. They, they look as though they've never been used. Come on, let's ride up and see. I'm glad there's a full moon, Jimmy. There are dozens of workmen's tools scattered all over the place. As if they were dropped in a tremendous hurry. As if someone panicked and ran. And not the faintest sign of a town. Or of life of any kind. 
anywhere. <laughs> Except for the coyotes. What do you make of it, Clark? I haven't the slightest idea. The furnaces. The smelters. They, they've begun to work by themselves. Joe! Joe, what is this? For heaven's sake, tell us what's going on. Better you ask him. Him? Who? The tall man who sits on rock over there, all alone. Man who never take eye of you. Where did he come from? You ask him. For over a hundred years, the wave of migration to the American West created a unique process that had a tremendous influence on the shaping of the American character. For some, it was what was called a gate of escape, a safety valve for the discontented. For others, like young Clark and Jimmy of our story, it was the thrill and the excitement of a daring new adventure. To where their particular journey would lead, we must wait for Act Two shortly. I'm lost and lonely, scared and sad, trembling at the thought of making me mad. My love is yours, but at times you're so cold. If life like this, take me before I grow This song about child abuse was written by a man who has served time in a state prison. It tells how he felt growing up as an abused child. Many of the social problems in America today spring directly from child abuse. Yet, with enough knowledge and enough money, child abuse can be prevented. Help us get to the heart of the problem. Write Prevent Child Abuse, Box 2866, Chicago, Illinois, 60690. Yo! Council and the National Committee for Prevention of Child Abuse. Have you started saving jewel gold register tapes? It's an easy and economical way for you to own a handsome Phoenix quartz watch. Choose from 15 styles, from time and date digitals to digitals with stopwatch and alarm, from sporty contemporary styles to elegant classics and golden tones. Each is battery powered for electronic accuracy 365 days a year. And prices start from just $7.99 with $100 in jewel gold tapes. That makes them truly affordable classics. So start saving your gold register tapes today. Collect $100 worth and you'll be able to take home your Phoenix watch right away. There's no waiting for the right timepiece when you collect gold register tapes from Jewel. We've been a friend of the family for 15 years. Your friend of the family. Friend of the family. Your friend of the family. Jewel. the late 1880s. Clark and Jimmy have come west and accompanied by an old Indian guide are in what had come to be known as the Arizona Territory. A hundred thousand square miles of dry and empty plains, of dry and scorching deserts. A raw and challenging frontier for the courageous, the adventurous, and especially for the young. Clark and Jimmy have just been startled by a sight they never expected to find in this barren wasteland of a desert. Joe, who is that standing over there? Better you ask him, that tall man who sits on rock over there all alone, who never take eye of you. You, over there, stand up. Jim, let's dismount. Now get your hands up over your head. Joe, take care of the horses. And now you, over there. Come towards us slowly. Are you deaf? I said come over here. I'll stay where I am. We, we both got you covered. What of it? One false move, stranger, and you're as good as dead. Did you say dead? <laughs> Jimmy, you help Joe start a fire, will you? I can take care of this old guy. Right, Clark. You, I said don't move and keep your hands high. Just where they are. I come in peace. 
Not looking for trouble. There's my rifle. Catch it. No tricks, I warn you. No, you you can put your hands down. I ain't that kind of you. Say, have you got any idea about that smokestack and those furnaces over there? Smokestacks? Furnaces? Yeah, there, there on your right. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> What's the joke? Hey, hey, you fellas from the east, ain't you? Yeah, what if we are? What you're looking at, that ain't no smokestacks nor furnaces, neither. They're not. Take another look. That's a big, tall growth of organ cactus with a lot of smaller ones scattered around it. In the moonlight, they kind of take on different shapes. But we both thought we heard... Well, never mind. <laughs> it was nothing. I'd like to ask what you're doing out here in the desert all by yourself in the middle of the night. I'm alone. Now. Except for the rattlesnakes, the lizards, and occasional coyote off in the distance. And them little road-running birds. You youngsters are the first living things I've seen in a long time. A very long time. Why did you say that you're alone now? Once there was four men, good men, all of them. Ramon Gallegos, a Mexican. Little Billy Shaw. Oh, the famous Desperado? A fellow from someplace back in Europe, Steve Binsick. And there was Barry Davis. They all started out from Tucson, crossed the Santa Catalina Mountains, just as you have, and traveled due west. They was prospecting. What for? Now, that's a stupid question. For silver, naturally. But they had no guide. This all happened a long time ago. Matter of true fact, it all happened 30 years ago. What's that you got hanging there from your belt? What, this? Yeah, it looks like a mop of some kind. A, a mop of long, black rope. What is it? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's all right with me. I, I see the joke. That's our Apache guide. Apache? Yeah, he and Jimmy, my friend, have got the fire started and thrown up the sleeping shed. You're welcome to join us for something to eat. No, no chow for me. I choose to sit right here for a bit. Suit yourself. Jimmy? We got a good fire going. Yeah, I want to talk to you. Our friend over there, I can't make him out. I don't think he's right in the head. Dangerous? I'd say he's quite harmless. Not really unfriendly, but a little peculiar. Well, maybe he's not as crazy as you think. Remember the solitary life so many of these men lead. I guess after a while it makes him look and sound a little, uh... Strange. Yeah, but traveling alone out in the middle of nowhere, in the dark of night? What's that? Over there. Coming towards us. Sounds like they might be grasshoppers. Millions of them. Joe! Joe, what do we do? We do nothing. We wait. They eat whatever they find. Then fly away. They're swooping down on us. They're right over our heads. Deep head down low. They not touch you. Soon they pass. Joe. Uh, Joe, would you say that a swarm of grasshoppers in the desert, where there's so little for them to eat, would, would you say that that was a little unusual? Very, how you say it, uh, very unusual. Well... Then how come? I say take road to north. You say take road to south. Yeah, of course. You know, this desert country ain't any more what it was in the old days. Back in the 18 and 50s, 30 years ago. What place is? In them days, it wasn't a ranch between the Gila and the Gulf. Well, maybe there ain't none now. There was always little grass near any water hole you could find. Enough to keep your animals from starvation. Well, what about the men? Oh, you went some time for days without food or drink. Then just as you was about to go mad, your luck would turn. And you'd come across a shallow pool of water at the bottom of an arroyo. 
You'd shoot some wild animal, an antelope, coyote, cougar, even eat some of them lizards. All was food. And the Indians? I don't want to talk about them. Why not? Not too long after the four men I spoke of had started out, the purpose of this expedition changed from discovery of wealth to preserving their lives. They'd gone too far to turn back, and what was ahead could be no worse than what was behind. So they pushed on. Riding at night, the way we are? Of course. Then came that morning when the Apaches finally had packed. They'd been following for almost a week. Must have been 40 or 50 of them, screaming their heads off, whooping down on the four of them, Ramon Gallegos, Lil Billy Shaw, Steve Vincent, and Davis. Well, what happened? 20 yards up a slope of some kind with some cliffs. Straight up and down they were, with a narrow opening you could just squeeze through. They ran into it and stayed there. All they had was their rifles. They knew the engines was watching them by day and night, waiting for one of the men to show. They held out for four days, and then... Yes? Uh, I'm very tired. I want some sleep. Oh, I think we all do. I'd, I'd like to know what happened. Later, Jimmy, later. Joe! Are the horses hobbled and picketed? Horses all fine. Well, a little sleep will do us all a lot of good. You care to join us under the sleeping shed? Well, thank you. I'll do my sleeping over yonder in the shade of that big cactus. Well, if you like. Oh, uh, here. Here's your rifle. Uh-huh. By the way, what are you called? What's your name? My name is Barry Davis. You awake? I am now. Something just woke me. Yeah, me too, Clark. What could it have been? What on earth am I hearing? What's that noise? It sounds like horses, galloping horses. Coming this way, I think. Joe? Joe, are you still asleep? Joe? Where is he, Jimmy? I haven't the slightest idea. He's disappeared. And he's left his big hat the first time I've seen it off his head. Well, I'll be... Clark! Look! Those Indians are riding like madmen, and they are headed in this direction, howling like a hundred devils. What do we do? Just stay as calm as we can. See what happens. They have got to be Apaches. Well, I don't think so. When their chief Geronimo surrendered two years ago, the Apaches became men of peace. Well, that doesn't sound very peaceful. Jimmy! They're shooting at our friend over there. They're shooting at Barry Davis. And he's shooting back at them. Now, shouldn't we do something to help? They got him. He's fallen over wounded. That, Clark. No, look. He, he's standing up again. He, he's aiming at the Indian who just shot him. That, he got him. Davis got the Indian. The Indian tumbled off his horse right onto the ground. Well, the others are turning around. Riding off in the direction they came from. But we better get out of here, but fast before anything else happens. Well, why? They couldn't have been less interested in us, and, and they certainly saw us. Uh, just the same, I am taking down the shed. Where on earth is old Joe? Just when we need him most. Look, you go ahead. I'm going to see what happened to Mr. Barry Davis. Jimmy. Huh? Jimmy, stop what you're doing. Uh, what's the matter? Take a look over there. By the big cactus where Barry Davis was sleeping. What do you see? I... I don't see a thing. Barry Davis? He's not there. But we saw him just a minute ago, didn't we? And... Where, where's the Indian he shot? Who fell off his horse who was lying wounded on the ground? He's not here either. What happened to them, Jimmy? Where did they go? came for adventure. We're certainly getting it. Look, let's pack up and move on. Clark, I, I don't like what's happening. It, it, it just isn't safe. Safe? 
A word I never thought I'd hear you use, Jimmy. And to top it all, just when we needed him most, old Joe Broken Arrow picks up and takes off to heaven knows where. Good thing we break camp now. Joe! Where have you been, Joe? We missed you. Feed horses. I picket them just over there. Ah, uh-huh, yeah, I see. Uh, how soon can we get started? Oh, soon. Maybe half hour, maybe less. Can't be too soon for me. Clark, do you hear anything? Just what I was going to ask you. Why, it sounds like bells. Church bells. Well, we must be near one of those old Spanish missions. Could be. Well, as soon as we're ready, what do you say we ride off in their direction and investigate? You know, Clark, I was just thinking of a line I remember from one of our courses at school. The life of an adventurer, and uh, that's us, is practicing the art of the impossible. Funny you should say that. I was thinking of another couple of lines from another course. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. The American poet Robert Frost ended one of his most well-known poems with Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Our young friends, given a choice of roads, have also taken the one less traveled by. And it's certainly leading them into adventure. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. It was just a habit I got into. Whenever I laughed, I kind of covered my mouth with my hand like this, you know? One day, it dawned on me that I was doing this because I was embarrassed by my teeth. They were really yellow from smoking. Topol Smoker's Tooth Polish, a special combination of polishing agents and a rich foaming cleaner, formulated to help remove ugly yellow tobacco stains. Topol is gentle enough to be used instead of regular toothpaste. My teeth are nice and bright again. Topol, mint flavor in the blue package, fluoride in the red. I visited my old college roommate, and she had Cuticura soap in her bathroom. Its for skin is part oily and part dry, so I tried it. Cuticura medicated soap is designed especially for combination skin, skin that's part oily and part dry. Cuticura deep cleans oily areas to remove dirt and excess oil, and its rich, creamy emollients help condition dry patches so skin feels soft, smooth, and moisturized. Use only as directed. Cuticura makes my skin look and feel terrific. Cuticura medicated soap for combination skin. This is News Radio 78, WBBM, Chicago. Here's a big bonus for frequent flyers of Delta Airlines, as well as would-be frequent flyers. Now you can fly first class on Delta for just $10 to $30 more than the regular coach fare. For short hops, pay just $10 more and ride first class. It's only $20 more for medium-length trips and $30 more for long trips. And if you're not already a member of Delta's frequent flyer program, simply fill out a temporary membership card and immediately take advantage of Delta's offer to go first class. Delta's frequent flyer program is the best of many airlines because free flights come easier on Delta thanks to double credits earned under many conditions, such as Delta trips that connect to or from more than 30 commuter airlines. Car rentals at Avis and Alamo plus lodgings at Marriott help you build Delta credits too. So call Delta or call your travel agent. Be a frequent flyer on Delta and get the bonuses. Delta is ready when you are. modern philosopher has written, we see the sun, the moon, and the stars revolving round us. That is false. We see the sun rise above the horizon. It is beneath us. We touch what we think is a solid body. There is no such thing. In a word, appearances are often the seeming truth which cunning time puts on to entrap the wisest. Young Jimmy Hayes may be about to meet still another seeming truth. Whoa, boy. Whoa. So, that's the little adobe shack where all that bell ringing is coming from. Just a couple of walls and no more than half a roof. No! No! It's too late. No one can help me now. No one. Hey, 
You! Stop waving that gun! Put down that gun! I mean no harm to no one, amigo. It's the end for me, senor. The end. I managed to squeeze through the opening in that cliff without being seen. By them. To search for food and water for the four of us. Four brave men. But they don't find nothing. It is the will of God I die. I... I have a little food here. Uh, water in this canteen. Here, take it. They wait for me, but I disappoint them. Who waits for you? Apaches. Two, three of them, they wait. Fifty feet away. Other side of that wall. But I beat them, amigo. I, I, I don't understand. I will not die by their hands. You will see. I have one bullet left in this gun. I shall use it well. Hey, well, wait a minute. Back Where are you going? Inside those walls to die. It is the will of God that I, Ramon Gallego, shall die. Ramon Gallego? Hey, hey, hold on there. I want to talk to you. Well, was one of those four men a, a fellow by the name of Barry Davis? Well, were you part of a... a... Ramon Gallego. Was that the single bullet you had left? Or did your Apache friends get you at last? Let's go, boy. Let's get back to camp. And that was the end of Ramon Gallegos. Uh, we're nearly ready, Joe. Nearly ready. Turn back, you fellows. Go back. Who's that? Somebody out there in the dark calling to us. You hear me? I say go back. Up ahead is bad things. Very bad. Much danger. Who are you? Me. I was miner in old country. No mining very good. Then come to U.S. of A. Four fellows. They join up together. Come out here. Prospect for silver. But this country too hard for those fellows. Big heat, no food, no water, and most bad of all, the Apaches. Bad enemy. Very bad. Not anymore. The Apaches are at peace with all of us. With you, maybe. Not with me. Never. Not with Gallegos. Not with little Billy Shaw. Not with Barry Davis. You. Yours. Steve Vincic, aren't you? Huh? Maybe. Maybe used to be a long time ago. You know, sooner or later, Indians going to get me. But I got idea. What's that? You got gun. You kill me. Please. You're out of your mind, Steve. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I am going to die pretty soon anyhow. This foolish go mad from thirst. Foolish I fall by Apache bullets. Maybe even be skinned alive. Look, please. On my knees, I beg you. Be kind. Take a gun. Shoot. No, we can't do that, Steve. We just can't. Let me help you up. Uh... I'm so sorry I trouble you. I leave you now. Where are you going? I walk. I walk. So far I can. No, no. Don't try to stop me. Where are you walking to? Away from here. Far away. You listen to me. You go back. Back! Huh. That would account for three of the four. I was just thinking. Ramon Gallegos, Steve Vincic, Little Billy Shaw, and Barry Davis. There's something going on that I don't quite understand. And I'm beginning to question how real all this is. Figure it out, Clark. Three men turning up out of nowhere. 
It's all of them talking about some kind of Indian massacre that may have taken place some 30 years ago. And pretty peculiar, all of them. One of them wears a mop of long black rope dangling from his belt. Your fellow, the Mexican with his one last bullet. Oh, and this last one. Begging for us to shoot him. And all of them getting themselves killed in one way or another. I don't know what to make of it, Jim. Joe Broken Arrow, our stone-faced friend up ahead, he of the black hat, he did warn us, you'll remember. Oh, sure. Take road to north, road to south, filled with evil spirits. Place of great danger to white men. Yeah, maybe he wasn't all that wrong. Jimmy, you're telling me you believe in spirits and ghosts? Let's just keep moving, Clark. I think I can make out the opening of a cave up over there where the mountains begin. We got to head for it. Catch a little sleep. What on earth is that? Joe, Joe, take care of the horses. Somebody out there is shooting at us. Hold your fire! Hold your fire, whoever you are! They couldn't see too well in the dark. It took you, gentlemen, for natives. The bad kind, I'm actually very sorry. I accept my apologies. Yeah, well, your apology is accepted, but... You know, you could have killed him. Oh, I should indeed have regretted that. Surely, even you two must have heard of little Billy Shaw, a very fast gun and one of the most daring desperados in the entire West. That's you? Your little Billy Shaw? I hope you'll pardon my appearance. There is an explanation. Gentlemen, I would like to make you a small... Proposition. I would like to propose that we join forces. The three of us. Well, what do you have in mind, Mr. Shaw? <laughs> Just call me Billy. That's what everybody calls me. But if I joined up with you two young gentlemen who are above any and all suspicion, the law would never find me, never think to look for me in the company of uh, fellows like yourself. I see. Well, I'm afraid, little Billy, that we must respectfully decline your generous offer. Charming, though I'm sure it would be. Uh, well, in that case, you leave me no choice. I shall rejoin my former companions, if I can find them. Thirty years is a long time. Gentlemen, I bid you good morning. Where did he go? I don't know. He just vanished. Disappeared into thin air. What do you make of that one? Well, I'm not sure. You figure him for a spirit? Maybe a ghost? Or an escaped lunatic. Better still, just a first-class liar. What's that? What? Those are our horses. Well, that son of a gun, that little Billy Shaw, he's gone off with every one of our horses. Not to worry, young gentlemen. We wait. Short time, all horses come back. You listen to Joe. Joe knows. Here we are at the mouth of that cave. And still, no horses. Oh, they come soon. Uh, let's go in and catch a couple of winks. No, no, no. You not go in there, not yet. Is bad place inside, I say to you when. What's bad about it? Look to east, sunrise very soon. I put on sacred shirt. I tell you something now. Long, long time ago, 25, maybe 30 years, bodies of four white men found in this same place. Men killed in bad days by my father's white men, all scalped. Then later, other white men come, find bodies, bury four inside a cave. And that makes this place unlucky? Oh, place filled with spirits of four dead men. Joe, were these men ever identified? Anybody know who they were? Oh, they all have papers say their names. I remember. You do? Ramon Gallegos, Steve Vincic, Little Billy Shaw, and Barry Davis. 
sort of a roll call of the dead. Now, while moon's still in sky, you look up there on top of Mesa. Huh? You see something? Silhouetted against the sky with a full moon behind them. The figures of four men standing there. Looking this way. Every month when full moon come, all four men come out of grave and haunt this barren land just like they do tonight. And you see, you see, like me, all have hat on head. Those men up there on the mesa. You say, Joe, that they're not alive? Look, look, I show you. What are you doing? I take a rifle and shoot at them. So. You missed. Oh, no, Joe, never miss. Those men dead for a long time. No shot can make dead men more dead. That first man you meet. Barry Davis. Well, what about him? He wound Indian who shot him. Later, he finds same Indian, and he scalp Indian. Indian die. Davis die. How do you know? What he wear hanging from belt you think is mop black rope? No. No, is scalp of Indian. Oh, how awful. I'm asking you. How do you know all this? I show you. I take off hat I always wear. Uh, you see? Oh, no. Joe Broken Arrow. That same Indian. But Joe, you said that after Barry Davis scalped you, that you died. Yes, yes, I know I say that. I say that because it's true. I did die. But you've been with us all this time. How on earth could you ever... There. You see, horses come back like I say. Now, sunrise, daylight come. Where are you going, Joe? Up to top of Mesa. Join other dead men. What for? Maybe because dead feel... How you say it? More comfortable with other deads. Gonna be hot day today. The American poet Stephen Vincent Benet, in his long narrative poem dedicated to the opening of the West, the poem he called Western Star, wrote... There were footprints upon the hill, and men lie buried under, tamers of the earth and rivers. They died at the end of labor. Forgotten is the name. I'll be back shortly. This is Gene King for your Better Business Bureau. To tip, how much to tip, or not to tip at all. You know, at one time or another, this always comes into question. Some experts say that one should always tip in a restaurant whether the service is horrendous or excellent. A mere 5% for poor service will get the message across without leading the waiter or waitress to believe that the omission was an oversight. And for good service, leave 15% of the pre-tax total. And for excellent service, 20% will do. Now, of course, if you just have a cup of coffee or a soft drink, a tip is unnecessary. But if you're a regular customer, it's a good idea to leave 50 cents now and then. Don't forget, waiters and waitresses count on tips for about two-thirds of their take-home pay. A tip from your Better Business Bureau. can rob a man of his life, but no one can rob him of his death. Death belongs to him and him alone, and to it a thousand doors lie open waiting for him. 
the words of Seneca, a philosopher of ancient Rome. The four spirits of our story, Roll Call of the Dead, had so little in common in life. It was only in the death they shared that they found togetherness. Our cast included Russell Horton, Lloyd Batista, Arnold Moss, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Ted would have a guilty conscience. Wilma, remember what Papa used to say? Time's running out. You have to make your move before it's too late. Feeling better, George? No, Doctor. Have some new pills. The latest drug. It may help. George? George? He's fallen asleep again, Doctor. Yes, so I see. Where are we? Exactly where we were at the beginning. Is there any hope? Theoretically, there's always hope. I mean real hope. I'm sorry. How much time does he have? Well, he could have as much as any of us, unless... Unless? He could have an accident. This is Tammy Grimes inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The drama we have produced for your enjoyment is adapted from an original short story called The Spectre Bridegroom. Its author was Washington Irving. Born to immigrant English parents in New York City on the 3rd of April, 1783. Many think that he was the prime mover in the introduction of the short story to this country. To be followed by such other masters as Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry James, and Mark Twain. Forgive me, sir. But I must go. I have a solemn and indispensable engagement. Surely you can send someone in your place. It admits of no substitutes. I must attend in person. But why? After all... The worms. The worms expect me. The grave is waiting for me. They will bury me at midnight. And I must be there. mystery drama, The Spectre Bridegroom, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Fellow Americans, if you're still shopping here and there and everywhere for shoes, hold it right where you are. Put your feet together, stop running around. Just step around a kitty and you'll cover the ground. Anywhere you want to go, head your feet in our direction. Kitty's got a rolling ball. Wow, what a star, what a great American shoe store. Kodak invites you to remember the special moments that make up the holiday season. And to trust them to Kodak film. A bike! Grandpa, you got 
me a bite. I got one, too, a red one. <laughs> no, you shouldn't have. I know. Oh, this is so I know. How did you know? I knew. Shouldn't you trust moments like these to Kodak film? If you're paying more for your car insurance than you can handle, remember, comparison shopping pays off. Arco American has been doing just that for thousands of Chicagoland motorists. Arco American has the time and the knowledge to shop for you. Every day, qualified buyers receive fantastic savings. As a matter of fact, the February 1979 issue of Family Circle magazine points out dramatically in their feature article on deflating your car insurance costs that there may be as much as 30% or more difference in costs for identical auto insurance policies. You definitely save if you shop. They repeat, Arco American has the time and the knowledge to shop for you. Call ES94677 for your free phone quotation. The savings could add up to hundreds of dollars for you. That's ES94677. Insurance plans are available with a low down payment and easy monthly installments. Shop and save money with Arco American. Call this number first thing in the morning, ES94677. That's ES94677. young country was struggling to its feet. The idea of a young man devoting himself exclusively to the writing of fiction was regarded as most peculiar and certainly unwise. But Washington Irving set his course early in life and never swerved from it. By the time he reached his 30s, he was not only acclaimed by his own countrymen and immensely popular, he was also hugely loved. Listen now to his story of the Spectre Bridegroom. I am Herta von Landshort, and I lived with my father the Baron and my Aunt Matilda in his castle on the very tip-top of the Odenwald, a most wild and romantic spot. I was just 18 years old at the time this all happened, and quite ready, yes, anxious, to be married to the gentleman my father, the Baron, had selected for me. Hertha, today is the day. I know, Father. I have lived for nothing else. Quite properly, Hertha. Your secluded life with your father and myself is about to end. And you will take your place in the world as the Countess von Altenberg. I received a message from Würzburg... Franz von Altenberg was accidentally detained there, but he expects to arrive within the next few hours. Uh, plenty of time to review your toilette once more. Yeah, and time for me to check upon each room of the castle, remind the servants of their duties, count the wine bottles again. Today, our hospitality must extend itself to the utmost. And I shall counsel you, Herta, one last time on how... To deport yourself, what to say, what to do, how to receive your expected lover. Listen well to your Aunt Matilda. Even though she never chose to become a bride herself, she knows the proper conduct. I had my chances, you know. In my day, I was known as quite a flirt. A veritable coquette. So I've been told, Aunt Matilda. Which is why I have guarded you so strictly... You may have resented my lectures on decorum. Oh, no. But they were intended to instill in you the ability to attract young men at the same time to keep them at a distance. Oh, providing, of course, they are properly authorized. No one can criticize your system of upbringing, Matilda. But uh, allow me some self-satisfaction that I have fathered a daughter with extraordinary beauty. That, too, might well appeal to Franz von Altenberg. Father, may I ask you something? Something perhaps trivial in your eyes? Ask whatever you like, my precious girl. Father, do you think he's handsome? My bridegroom? The day dragged by. My intended bridegroom did not appear. Hour rolled after hour. The sun which had poured his downward rays upon the rich forest now just gleamed along the summit of the mountains. We waited. We waited. The last ray of sunshine departed. The bats began to flit by in the twilight. 
The road leading to the castle grew dimmer and dimmer to the view. Nothing appeared stirring in it. Night closed in. An hour ago, I thought I saw the Count and his attendants. I thought I heard the sound of horns floating from the valley. Some horsemen advanced along the road, but suddenly they had turned off in a different direction entirely. Since then, there's been nothing. No sound of horns, no sound of horses' hooves, no sound of voices. Nothing. He's not coming. Brother, what am I to tell the servants? What of the bank would they have spent three days preparing? Matilda, give orders for the feast to commence. Without the guest of honor? Without him. He's not coming. Tell them all to seat themselves at the table. Tell the servants to pour the wine, bring in the delicacies. Oh, how are we to go through with this farce, this travesty? The best way we can. Go, Matilda. Seat the guests. Summon the servants. Let the banquet begin. Etta and I will join you in a moment or two. It's intolerable. Unendurable. He doesn't want me. No, no, my child. He has reconsidered, and he doesn't want me. There may be an acceptable explanation. You had a message from Würzburg, and Würzburg is not so far from here. He could have covered the distance long before now. Yes, that's true enough. There can be but one reason why he has not arrived. He has reconsidered, and he does not want me. Oh, my darling child. Someone has told him that I am not worthy, that my intelligence is insufficient, that my appearance is unattractive. Oh, no one could say such things. They have told him that I am undesirable, and he has changed his mind. He is not coming. He does not want me. No, no. Oh, yes, Father. We must face the truth. Brother, the guests are seated. Herta? Come, my child. We must brazen it out one way or another. Come, Herta. Uh, what's that? A horn. A horn. I heard a horn. Do you think? Could it be? He's here. He's here. Franz von Altenberg is here. Oh, admit him, brother. Go to the door and let him in. Oh, praise the good Lord. Aunt Matilda, do you think? Who else could it be, my darling? Welcome, my dear Count von Altenberg. I am the Baron von Landshort. Welcome to our home. Come in, come in. I am sorry. So very sorry. No need to be sorry, my dear fellow. Not now, not at this joyful moment. No need at all. To break in upon you like this. I listen to no apologies, not at this happy time. Come, let me present you to my sister, Matilda. Count von Altenburg. And this, this dear Franz, I may call you Franz, I trust, under the circumstances. This Franz is my daughter. My daughter, Hertha. I am so happy. We are all so happy that you are here. So very happy. I too. I am so very happy that I am here. Well, why are we standing here like ninnies? Oh, yes. The, the table is all set for you, Count Van Oldenburg. The guests have taken their places. Everyone will be impatient to greet my daughter's intended husband. Count Franz... Will you give Hertha your arm? Um, with pleasure. Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, would you permit me, Hertha? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I remember little of the banquet. I sat on my father's left. The Count across the table from me on my father's right. We addressed few words directly to each other, but... Oh, the looks that passed between us. They were lovers' looks. I could not doubt, inexperienced as I most certainly was, that he was as enamored of me as I of him. And I had been a fool to worry that he might be less than handsome. And yet... As the feast progressed, 
He seemed to grow dejected, ill at ease, and finally downright melancholy. A tiny tremor ran through my frame as, with a somber look, he rose from his seat. Oh. Uh, Baron, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all. What is it, my dear Count? Yeah. It is with the utmost regret, with grief, with sorrow, that I say farewell to you. What's that you say? Farewell? Leave the castle at midnight? Why, everything was prepared for your reception. That A chamber is ready for you if you wish to retire. I'm sorry, Baron. It cannot be. I must lay my head in a different chamber this night. You cannot mean what you say. Franz, I beg of you. Don't leave us. Not now. We have waited so long. Why are you doing this? You must have a reason. There must be a reason for your going. I could have sworn that we... You and I... There is a reason for my leaving you. Then in heaven's name, tell us. I have a solemn and indispensable engagement. Well, can you not send someone in your place? It admits of no substitute. I must attend in person. I must return to Würzburg Cathedral. Well, yes, but not until tomorrow. Tomorrow you will take your bride to the cathedral in Würzburg. My engagement is with no bride. What? What is he saying? Then what? What does he do? Then, then who? The worms. The worms expect me. I am a dead man. My body lies at Würzburg. At midnight, I am to be buried. What are you saying? The grave is waiting for me. I must keep my appointment. Uh, farewell. Farewell all. Farewell. Farewell. He's gone. What did he mean? What could he possibly he mean? He has left me. What was he talking about? He did not want me after all. What the devil was the man saying? He was no man. What? No man? No man, Matilda? Oh, yes, he was a man. But he did not want me. He is not a man, Matilda. What was he? A spectre. A spectre? What are you saying, woman? No, no, he was no spectre. He was to be my bridegroom. He was a spectre. The spectre of a bridegroom. time Washington Irving was 36 years old, he had written a collection of essays, sketches, and tales. They were published in 1819 under the title of The Sketchbook and made Irving something of a celebrity. There were only three stories in The Sketchbook. One of them was The Spectre Bridegroom. The other two are among the most famous tales ever written. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. When I started working at this bakery, my boss sounded like this. Raymond, you're eating all the profits. So one day, I started bringing coffee to work. Maxwell House coffee. And just to be sociable, I offered him a cup. Mmm, Raymond, this coffee is delicious. Then he made me a deal. He said... Raymond, <laughs> you supply the coffee, I'll supply the cake. Maxwell House is coffee that makes good friends. Sinus flares up. I'm clogged up. Headaches. My whole face hurts. Help. Set for sign off. Sign off helps relieve your pain. Helps clear congestion, ease sinus pressure and post-nasal drip. Sign off does it all. Send for sign off. And for the fastest known form of congestion relief, sign off spray. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. -F. Sign off. The sinus medicines in the bright red box. Is here. For occasional use only as directed. Toro has come out with a great idea, and Polk Brothers has it, a powered snow shovel. It's so lightweight it even hangs up where the old backbreaker is now, and it's only $89.95, less a Polk trading allowance. And you also get a 100-foot heavy-duty winterized extension cord. All you do is plug it in, squeeze the handle, and poof, goes the snow. 
a real heart saver, another great gift idea. With your purchase for only $10, you can buy the very famous Toro Edger Weeder Trimmer. It's a $49.95 value. Makes a great Christmas gift, and it's packed in its own shipping carton. Visit Polk Brothers today and see a fine selection of other snowblowers available right now. Gas or electric bottles, even ones with electric start. Remember, with your purchase of the Toro Snow Shovel or Snow Blower, you get the $49.94 Toro Edger Weeder Trimmer for only $10 at Polk Brothers. Polk Brothers is open nightly, including Saturday till 10, on Sundays till 6, for your shopping convenience. You are listening to a tale of horror and romance. An irresistible combination, especially when told in the well-known Gothic style. So-called Gothic stories were enormously popular in Washington Irving's day, and they have continued to be in demand by the reading public, and now the listening public. It is good to remember that the Gothic romance was assisted into the world by an American, Mr. Washington Irving. <laughs> I had Matilda von Landshort. When my sister-in-law died giving birth to Hertha, my brother the Baron asked me to undertake the rearing of his motherless daughter. She grew into a young lady of perfect docility and correctness. Was this to be my reward for years of careful, constant supervision that she and I and her father should be deceived, deluded? Yes, cheated. Cheated by a visit from a phantom. The answer, the tragic reply to that question, arrived the day after the banquet. And it was myself who had to relay it to my brother, the Baron. Yes? Who is it? It is I, brother. Matilda? Enter. Oh, brother dear. Yes, yes, yes. What is it, Matilda? I... Well, we ha- had a message. Well, yes, what message? Speak up. I have asked Herita to join us here. She'll be along presently. After all, the message concerns her most of all. Anything which concerns my daughter intimately concerns me. This concerns her intimately. There's no doubt of that. Well, then tell me what it is. I give you warning, Matilda, not to trifle with me today after the shocking events of yesterday evening, the grotesque ending to what was to have been such a joyful banquet. My nerves are on edge and I cannot tolerate silly shallying. So tell me whatever it is you're stammering about. The message. The message is from Würzburg. 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 But it was to Würzburg that the Count said he must go. When he left us so precipitously. Yes. To the cathedral. To keep an engagement, he said. With the worms, that is what he said. To be buried. At midnight. Brother, the message which has just been delivered says that France, Count von Altenburg, was murdered. Murdered? You said murdered? Murdered. Yesterday, his body found and interred in Würzburg Cathedral at midnight. No. Oh, no. I can't believe... It's true, brother. Aunt Matilda, father, you wish to speak with me? Oh, my poor child. My dearest child. How can I tell you... Let me do it. Herta, we just had word that the Count von Altenburg was murdered yesterday and his body interred in the cathedral at Würzburg. But... But he was here last night. That was a phantom. Don't you know that by now, an apparition? Your Count died, and what arrived here was a specter. A specter bridegroom. You can well imagine the dismay that settled upon the castle. My brother shut himself up in his chamber. The servants huddled in groups, shaking their heads and shrugging their shoulders. But the situation of the widowed bride was the most pitiable. To have lost a husband before she even embraced him. And such a husband. Of course, 
I insisted on sleeping alongside her in her chamber. Herta? Herta, my dear? Yes, Aunt Matilda? Oh, have you slept at all, my precious? No. Oh, my poor darling, what am I to do with you? There's nothing to be done. But you must have your rest. You'll lose your beauty, your young freshness, if you do not sleep. I have no further use for beauty. Or freshness, or youth. I'm widowed. And I've never been a bride. Try, my dear one. Try to sleep. No. I simply lie here and gaze at the beams in the rising moon, trembling on the leaves of the aspen trees, and think of him. Your specter bridegroom. Whom I love with all my heart, and shall love forever. Oh, my dear, don't say it. Ed, what are you doing? Nothing. Only going to the window to look down on the garden. Oh, well, wait. I'll, I'll join you. There's no need to... N- n- nevertheless... Ah! Be quiet, Aunt. He's there. He's come back. Do you see him, Herita? Herita, do you see him? Of course I see him. It's your specter bridegroom. Yes. The man I love. Herita, have you seen this specter before from this window? No, but I have expected him, and now he is here. No, come away from the window. And he will come back again and again and again. He will be my consolation. You cannot console yourself with a specter. What else do I have? Uh, we will sleep in a different bedchamber. Oh, no, no, Aunt Matilda. I refuse to sleep here again. We'll move to another wing of the castle, you and I. You may sleep wherever you like, Aunt. I shall sleep here. Young lady, are you defying me? I suppose I am. Herta, I fear for you. I tremble for your safety. Do not tremble and have no fear. As I love my lover, so now do I love his specter. Leave me, please. Oh, well, if I must. You must. And one more thing. What is that, my heart? Swear that you will never repeat to anyone what has transpired here this night. Oh, oh, Herta. Swear by the saints you will keep my secret. By the holy saints, I swear. What else could I do? I am deathly afraid of ghosts, spirits, shadows, anything from beyond the grave. That my sweet niece should be able to endure this silent communion with a specter was beyond me. Yet I must admit, in all candor, during the days that followed, her health improved. Her disposition brightened. Her expression held a look of serenity. Yes, even of happiness that I had never seen before. Until, until I made the horrible, the hideous discovery. Matilda! You're late for breakfast. Yes, yes, I I know. My apologies. No, there's no need to apologize. I'm simply accustomed to finding you at the table when I come down. Brother, I... I... You needed to sleep, I understand. No, I... Oh, now that I look at you, you're pale. You're even trembling. Brother, I must tell you something. Where is Hertha? Did you waken her? I went to her room. Well, then, she'll be down momentarily. Come, Matilda, eat a little something. It'll pick you up. I must tell you about Herta. Have you observed how well she's been looking lately? Uh, yes, yes. And how but... her spirits have improved? I must tell you about Herta. Please let me. Of course, of course. Well, it, it's very difficult. Well, now, how difficult can it be? You and I have no secrets from each other. Now, what is it? I do have a secret, something I've kept from you. I took a sacred oath. What is it? Well, speak up in heaven's name. Well, I, I shall have to go back to the day we received the message from Würzburg. That the Count had been murdered. His body interred in the cathedral. Yes, yes, yes. Do you remember that Herder was stricken to the heart? Well, of course she was, to lose a bridegroom. The specter of a bridegroom. She was so distraught, I feared for her very life. And so did I. That is why I moved into her bedchamber and slept beside her. Not that she slept very much. Then one night, I spoke to her. I was sure she was wide awake. I told her that if she did not sleep, she would lose her beauty, waste her youth. She said neither beauty nor youth had any value to her since 
Her heart lay with him, with the man she had promised to marry, and had never even kissed. The Count. The shadow of the Count. Then, without warning, she got out of bed, went to the window. She said it was only to gaze down in the garden. I said I would join her at the window, and I did. Oh, brother, I looked out the window into the garden, and there, there he stood, gazing up to the second story from where we looked down on him. Are you saying I that... screamed. I screamed so loud I should have wakened the entire household. For what I saw in the garden was the specter bridegroom. No. Yes, yes, it is true. I swear it. I must say to you that there was still the semblance of manly beauty about him. He looked something the same as he had when he came here for the banquet. I can understand a little, at least, why she found him endearing. Endearing? You said endearing? How can a shadow be endearing? I said as much to her, and she replied... I, I shall never forget her words. She said, Where the substance is not to be had, the shadow must suffice. Good Lord. Moreover, she said she expected him to return night after night, again and again, and she would observe him from her window. She said... He would be your consolation. And did he? Did he come again? I think he must have. I, of course, could not continue sleeping in that chamber. I moved to another room, and she stayed where she was. I believe that each night she has silently communed from her window with her spectral bridegroom. Well, you must admit it's done her no harm. On the contrary, she has blossomed. She has bloomed. Yes, I admit the truth of that. Still, I, I should have been told. You should have told me, Matilda. She swore me to secrecy. She extracted my vow that I would never breathe a word of her unholy trysts. Mm. This morning, a half hour passed. I went as I have always done to awaken her for breakfast. And she's not there. What? Not there. Where is she? I have searched the castle, every nook and cranny. Have searched the grounds of the estate. She is nowhere to be found. It's impossible. Utterly impossible. Summon the staff. We shall all look for we her. We will not find her. Why not in the name of heaven? Because the specter... The specter has carried her away. <laughs> My poor brother, the Baron, he ran frantically about the castle. He questioned every servant, and two of them said that they had heard the night before the clattering of a horse's hoofs down the mountain near the hour of midnight. They had no doubt that it had been the specter on his black charger bearing her away to the tomb. As for myself, I had known it all along. In 1789, George Washington was inaugurated president in New York City. So Irving would have been five years old when, it is said, on seeing our first president enter a shop, a young Scottish maidservant followed him with young Irving in tow and said, Please, Your Honor, here's a bairn who was named after you. Whereupon the great man touched the small boy's forehead and gave him his blessing. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. They said it couldn't be written. The book that hit America like a runaway locomotive. The new Consumer Information Catalog. For the life of me, Foster, your obsession with that book escapes me. It's only a catalog. The book that's helping America find a better way to live. What do you find in that catalog? Something you could never give me, Lillian. More than 200 fact-filled federal publications listed inside. Booklets on home and car repairs, weight control, keeping household records, and more. I read them all. 
to be the man you want me to be. That's a lot of reading. The book you have to read from the Consumer Information Center of the U.S. Government. The new Consumer Information Catalog. It's free. Just write to Free Catalog, Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. That's Free Catalog, Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. Send for the book. Don't wait for the movie. Anyway, you slice it. True Value Hardware Store's December bargain of the month is a real value. The Hamilton Beach Electric Knife for just $9.77 is a practical Christmas gift for a busy homemaker. Or buy one for yourself and use it to cut and slice meats, bread, vegetables, and more. Just guide the knife and let the serrated stainless blades do the cutting for you. The reciprocal action of the blades assures you of fast, clean cuts. And the Hamilton Beach Electric Knife from True Value Hardware Store's features the famous hole-in-the-handle design for ideal carving control and ease. Plus, the extra long cord provides greater convenience. Get the Hamilton Beach electric knife from the decorative almond and chocolate design for just $9.77. It's the December bargain of the month while supplies last at participating True Value Hardware Stores. True Value It's 1 a.m. on News Radio 78, WBBM, Chicago. The moment you step into Polk Brothers Television Department, your eyes go wild. Hundreds of brand new, brand name 1980 models turned on and operating. You'll see the name Sony, all their models, their new 26 inch console, the new long playing Sony Betamax video cassette recorder, color and black and white portables. They're Polk priced. Even bigger savings thanks to Polk trade and allowances. And with your purchase of any Sony TV at all Polk Brothers stores, a free Polk gift designed to help your entire family enjoy a better life. The two-volume hardcover 2495 edition of Sylvia Porter's new money book for the 80s. Specific expert advice on everything from college loans to budgets, buying T-bills to wills, over 1,400 pages of tips on beating the high cost of living. Polk Brothers is proud to bring you this free gift with most major purchases. We're convinced it can be the greatest financial counselor your teenagers or you could ever have. So get set for the 80s at Polk Brothers, night little 10 till 6 on Sunday. Why is the linking of terror with romance so fascinating? Not just today, but through the ages. Folklore is filled with just this conjoining. The Greeks, in their fables, bound passionate love together with mysterious and drastic outcomes. So did the Romans. To this day, we are all inexorably drawn to the story that tells of wild, uncontrollable love combined with hideous consequences. Why should this be so? Frankly, I haven't the faintest idea. I am Hendrik von Starkenfaust. I was on my way home from the army when my horse lost a shoe. The village of Würzburg was not far away, so I left him there and turned him over to the local blacksmith to be reshod. I myself was somewhat exhausted and looked about for a tavern where I might refresh myself until my horse was ready to finish the journey. I followed the sound of revelry and soon found myself inside a cheery room with a fire roaring, men sitting at polished tables, and a pretty waitress. She had just brought me a stein of beer when I felt a hand on my shoulder and heard a familiar voice. Hendrik, it's you, isn't it? Hendrik von Starkenfast? That's my name, yes. Am I to gather that you do not recognize me? Oh, merciful heavens, you are Franz von Alterberg. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, of course, I'm Ra Franz. How are you? Splendid. And you, Hendrik, how are you? <laughs> You're looking well? A little weary? <laughs> Very well? Yes, I am well, and if I look weary, it's only because I'm just home from the wars. My horse threw a shoe, and I'm waiting for the local blacksmith to fix him up. Then I'll be off again. <laughs> My family is expecting me. I'm anxious to get home. Hey, mind if I sit down? Oh, dear fellow, of course I don't mind. I'm delighted. Sit down. Tell me all that's happened since last we met. I've got myself betrothed. No. Yes. Yes, I have. In a day or two, I shall take to myself a bride. Now, there's something you've not been able to accomplish away at the wall. Hey, no, you're right about that. Though, if I tried very hard, I... 
<laughs> but I am not particularly interested in taking a bride at the moment. I'll wait a bit, I think, till some particular girl, some superlative creature crosses my path. Ah, but by then it'll be too late, my dear Henry. Ah, what makes you say that? Because by then, the superlative creature will be married to me. Oh, you don't say. <laughs> from all that I've heard, from every direction, she's one of the fairest damsels in these parts. What you've heard? You've never seen her? No, but I shall tonight. Her father's readying the most elaborate banquets imaginable to celebrate the betrothal. And her father is? The Baron von Lanshort. Ah. A worthy member of a fine family. Yes, I've heard of the Baron. He lives not far from my family's domain. Unhappily, there has been some bad blood between my family and the Baron. One of those foolish feuds going back so far that no one remembers how it started. So I've... Uh, I've never set foot in his castle, nor met him or any member of the family. Look here, Hendrik. If you're going home... And my parents are expecting me. My retinue is sojourning here in Würzburg for a few hours. I promised them the rest and relaxation... But as soon as your horse is fit for travel, let us, the two of us, start off together. Since we're bound in the same general direction. A splendid idea. We've much to talk about, and I need to hear more about your future wife. She has been guarded like a delicate flower, they tell me. And they say she looks like one, too. Yes, uh, Franz, this forest is said to be infested by robbers. Her Aunt Matilda has watched her like a hawk. Yes, I know for a fact there are hordes of disbanded soldiers wandering about. They can be dangerous. Hertha von Landshort will be the crowning glory of my life. Franz. Okay, behind the tree. Draw your sword, my friend. Draw your sword. Be quick. Be quick. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. The are approaching, France. Badly sick. The robbers heard them and they have fled. Uh, it's too late. It's too late. No, 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 no. no, no. Don't try to lift me. It hurts too much. What can I do? Tell me. Go. Go to the castle of the Baron of Lanshort and tell them. Explain. Say why I, why I cannot keep my appointment with my bride. You will do this, Hendrik. Franz. Else I shall not sleep quiet in my grave. I promise you have my word. Here, I... take my hand. You have my pledge. My, my beautiful bride, my fair one. Franz. She, she waits for me. She waits. Oh, bring, bring, bring my horse. Uh, I shall mount, yes. I shall mount and ride. Rest. Ah, ah, uh, here it is. Uh, give me a leg up, someone. Uh, up in the, into the saddle. Uh, reins in my hands. The spurs press into my horse's sides. Now, uh, now, uh, forward. Forward. Slow trot. Now, uh, fast trot. Uh, in, into a canter. Now, now a gallop. Fast trot. He died in his delirium. In Würzburg, I arranged with the Holy Fraternity of the convent for the funeral solemnities and my friend's burial in the cathedral near some of his illustrious relatives. His retinue took charge of his remains and I set off on my sorrowful journey. I shall confess to you, whisperings of curiosity stirred in my bosom to see the far-famed beauty of whom he had said so much. Though my heart was heavy and my head perplexed at the thought of presenting myself an unbidden guest among traditionally hostile people, of dampening their festivities with tidings fatal to their hopes. You can imagine my surprise when the door was opened. Welcome, my dear Count von Altenberg. I am the Baron von Landshort. Welcome to our home. I am sorry. I am so very sorry. No, there's no need to be sorry. Not at this joyful moment. To break in upon you like this. Let me present you to my sister, Matilda. Count von Altenberg. And this... 
This is my daughter, Hertha. Hertha. I am so happy. We are all so happy that at last you are here. So very happy. I too. I am so very happy that I am here. Well, why are we all standing here like ninnies? Uh, the table is all set. The guests have taken their places. We were simply waiting for you. We were certain you would arrive. And now you see, here you are. So without further delay, shall we go into the banquet hall? Everyone is impatient to greet my daughter's intended husband. Count, will you give Hertha your arm? Uh, I? Oh, uh, with pleasure. Uh, yes, so certainly. Uh, would you permit me, Hertha? Oh, yes. Yes. I scarce remember the banquet. I suppose I conducted some sort of conversation with my dinner partners. But my eyes kept straying to the beautiful girl across the table from me. And her eyes strayed too. Believe me, every glance of mine was returned. I dared hope with the same feeling of tenderness behind them that inspired mine. The situation was unbearable. I was an imposter, a deceiver. I had usurped the life of my friend. Suddenly, I rose from the table. Baron, <coughs> ladies, gentlemen, <coughs> it is with great regret, great grief, that I say farewell. Leave us at midnight? Why, everything was prepared for your reception. A chamber is ready for your reception. A chamber is ready for you if you wish to retire. Uh, it cannot be. I must lay my head in a different chamber this night. Don't leave. We've waited so long. Why are you doing this? There must be a reason for your desertion. I could have sworn that we... That you and I... Yes, there is a reason. I have a solemn and indispensable engagement. Well, can you not send someone in your place? It admits of no substitutes. I must attend in person. I must return to Würzburg Cathedral. Not until tomorrow. Then you will take your bride there. My engagement is with no bride. Well, then what? Who, then? The worms. The worms expect me. I am a dead man. My body lies at Würzburg. At midnight, I am to be buried. What are you saying? The grave is waiting for me. Uh, farewell. Farewell. It was a stammering exit. I was trying to tell them that I was not Franz von Altenberg, that I was not the husband they planned for their daughter, but simply his friend who had held him while he died. And that my family had feuded with theirs for heaven knows how many years. I was torn with regret to have deceived them, but as much by the thought that I would never see Hertha again. This was the agony that drove me back to the castle, not to speak to her, merely to stand beneath her window and gaze up at her and wonder of wonders to see her gaze down at me. Each and every night until her window opened. Are you there, my love? Hilda. Have you come to claim me? I have no right. No right to claim one who loves you? Hilda, I am not Franz von Altenberg. You are not? No. No, I am Hendrik von Starkenfast. My family's domain is nearby, but our ancestors have not acknowledged one another for years and years. Have they not? Franz was killed by robbers on his way to claim you. I was with him when he died. Were you? He is buried in the cathedral at Würzburg. I came here that first evening to tell you that. Did you? But then, then when I saw you, I... I lost my heart to you. Did you indeed? I could not bear to blurt out what I have told you. I was so afraid. Afraid of me? Afraid that you would despise me. Afraid that I could never make you love me. 
But after all the, these nights, these silent trysts, when, when you looked down on me in the garden and I looked up at you, I, I have dared to hope. Hope plucks at my heart that you... That, 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 that you... Yes, that I... That you do love me, even as I love you. I am going to close tight the window now, Henry. Hetta. In ten minutes, I will come to you in the garden. And you will carry me off to the cathedral at Würzburg. We were married in Würzburg. And when all was explained, all was forgiven. And the revels were resumed. Aunt Matilda confided in me that she was so relieved that I was not, uh, had never been, a specter. She would have pardoned me anything at all. As for the Baron, well, let him speak for himself. I am, on the whole, well pleased with my son-in-law. He's gallant, he's generous, and he's... Very, very rich. You see how foolish and how dangerous it can be to believe in specters, phantoms, ghosts. Any one of them may turn out to be a real flesh and blood person. And there's this, too. Besides being a real person, he might also turn out to be... Very, very rich. Think about that. I'll be back shortly. Children, we take them for granted. We shouldn't, for they are the future of the world. But not all children are happy. Some are refugees from a war they never made. Others are young people in trouble with the law. To them, too, the world is an alien place. Something to defend against, whatever the cost. <laughs> Still others are abused, or hungry, or just in need of some understanding. Because all these children represent our future, 1979 has been designated the International Year of the Child. Your American Red Cross joins organizations in 118 nations in urging you to do something this year in your community to help your children and children everywhere. To find out what we're doing and how you can help, contact your Red Cross chapter. Thank you. The Gothic tale is international. Starting with the Castle of Otranto by the Englishman Horace Walpole, it was followed and improved upon by Honoré de Balzac in France. In America, the form was carried on by Washington Irving and brought to a peak by the genius of Edgar Allan Poe. It may be foolish and dangerous to believe in specters, but it certainly is fun to listen to them. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Robert Dryden, Grace Matthews, and Patsy Bruder. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next it's so very warm, Clarissa said. Can't we take a short ride in the buggy, Mother? I said, let's. It might cool us off. So the little pony was hitched up, and Clarissa, and ah, uh, 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 go on. Uh, we had barely got out of the gate to the outpost. Well, well, Think hard, Mrs. Armstrong. Uh, I, I can't go on. You are outside the gate to the outpost. You're in the buggy drawn by the pony. And then... Oh, good Lord! Clarissa, run! 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 Oh, Clarissa! Oh. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
It's in news. We're CBS News Radio 78, WBBM Chicago. <laughs> were killed Monday night in a panicked scramble for seats at a Cincinnati concert. I'm David Jackson reporting on the CBS radio network. The crush occurred outside Cincinnati's Riverfront Coliseum. Details from newsman Tom McKee. Thousands of music lovers had arrived early for entrance to the arena to see the rock group The Who. Many had reserved tickets for specific seats. Others had what in effect are general admission tickets for so-called festive seating. That means once inside the concert hall, they could sit anywhere on the floor they wanted to. It was apparently the rush for those seats which triggered the crowds pushing and shoving once the doors were open, and apparently only a few doors were open. The stampede lasted only briefly, but the fire department's medical disaster team was called in to aid victims lying outside the arena. Inside, the concert went on with many patrons unaware of the tragedy that had taken place outside. What caused the stampede? Why were so many people killed? Will concerts be staged in the future? Those are questions to be answered in an investigation by Cincinnati city officials. Tom McKee for CBS News in Cincinnati. More news after this. Here's how to improve on the traditional 12 days of Christmas. Now you can give the 12 months of Christmas with a gift subscription to Smithsonian Magazine. 12 monthly gift packages of entertainment and pleasure, of ideas and achievements, information and knowledge. Smithsonian ranges the world, delving into science, history, the arts, culture, just about every aspect of the human adventure. Smithsonian is uniquely rewarding, rich in facts and sources, sumptuous in stunning color illustrations. Each article brings out all of the excitement of the subject for lively, literate reading. A gift subscription to Smithsonian is only $12 for the year and includes enrollment as an associate member of the Smithsonian Institution. To order, simply call this toll-free number in the continental U.S. now, 800-648-5000. The number again is 800-648-5000, except in Nevada. A gift card will be sent in your name and in time for Christmas. You'll be billed later, but you must order soon, today, now, Smithsonian, for 12 months of Christmas. A resolution calling for the release of the American hostages in Tehran is expected to be introduced at Tuesday's session of the United Nations Security Council. U.S. Ambassador Donald McHenry says he thinks it'll be approved either Tuesday or Wednesday. Senator Edward Kennedy's comments late Sunday critical of the Shah's regime in Iran and of past U.S. policy toward the Shah drew sharp criticism Monday from the State Department. Not helpful, said spokesman Hotting Carter. The comments might upset delicate ongoing negotiations to end the Iranian crisis. From the White House itself, a no comment of sorts, as Robert Pierpoint reports. President Carter will not answer Senator Kennedy's charges about the Shah, leaving that to others in his administration, says Press Secretary Jody Powell. Mr. Carter does not think it would be appropriate or helpful to get into such a political debate, Powell said, while our hostages are being held in Iran. Powell defended the president's decision to send the Shah by Air Force jet to a military base in Texas on the grounds that it is a continuation of a humanitarian policy to provide the Shah medical treatment and physical security until the United States can find another country that will admit him. Administration officials don't think Egypt would be a safe place for either the Shah or Egyptian President Sadat, for that matter, if he went there. Pressed on whether the Shah could stay in Texas permanently, Powell made it clear he could not, without actually saying so, pointing out that the Shah himself has said he wants to leave as soon as possible. Another high administration official put it more bluntly. If the Shah had any class, this source said, he would have left long ago. Robert Pierpoint, CBS News, at the White House. House Speaker Thomas O'Neill said Monday that he's heard four different countries have offered the Shah a home in exile. He did not say which four. So far, Egypt is the only nation to publicly offer the Shah a haven. President Carter is about to enter the presidential race officially, the announcement to come at the White House Tuesday afternoon. A military court in South Korea Tuesday opened the trial of eight men accused in the October assassination of President Park Chung-hee. Shortly after it began, the senior officer suspended the hearing, pending a Korean Supreme Court decision whether the accused should be tried in a military or a civilian court. Now this. Duratest still has exciting career opportunities in Chicago, Houston, New York, and New Orleans. But the men and women we want must be as hardworking as they are ambitious. I'm Ray McGrother, president of Duratest, America's largest manufacturer of specialized lighting, and a pioneer in energy-saving Wattsaver light bulbs. 
Many have already responded to my announcement of career opportunities in St. Louis, Miami, and Sioux City. DuraTest wants good people who are willing to do a good job for a good living. We'll train you to be a lighting specialist and consultant. And we also have openings right now in Oklahoma City, Toledo, Lansing, and Jacksonville. At DuraTest, we're looking for hard-working sales representatives all over America. For details, call us toll-free in the continental U.S. at 800-648-5000, except in Nevada. Call us right now at 800-648-5000. That's 800-648-5000. DuraTest. Maybe we can light up your future. A step forward Monday night for London's Rhodesia peace plan, Britain's cabinet authorized appointment of a British governor to lead Zimbabwe Rhodesia toward new elections. Patriotic Front guerrillas still have not accepted that plan, but the British are saying the guerrillas are welcome to come aboard any time. British sources say the governor's post will go to Lord Soames, a son-in-law of the late Winston Churchill. David Jackson, CBS News. Come call us 126 in the morning, is there? Hello again. It's Tuesday, the uh, 4th of December, isn't it already? And uh, this is uh, you-know-who, and with us, of course, helping us out as usual, Dave Ennett is our producer-editor, Mort Mortison, our technician. 